Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 230, featuring the second installment of my interview with Mr. Stuart Chaffee of Computer Chronicles. In this part of the interview, we get uh, some more information about the computer industry, specifically the uh, the CEOs and the people behind some of this stuff. Uh, people like Jack Tremell, uh, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, uh, Michael Dell. Uh, Stuart's got a lot of great stories about these folks that you won't hear anywhere else. It's really fascinating stuff. Anyway, we've got a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Stuart Chaffee. So you said that you had lots of encounters on the show with people that would show up and it really would be more interested in pitching their products or yeah. hyping it up and uh, you would have to constantly try <clears throat> to rein, it, rein them back in. Exactly. Uh, I'm just wondering if you could give me some examples of this and, and how you dealt with it. Well, the problem is we would, I say, if we, if we had a technology guy, it was not a problem. They were good. But if we got a marketing guy or a, a CEO, what they had done before they got on our show was do some pitch at, at a Comdex or in front of some investors or something, and they were used to controlling it, giving their you know ten minute spiel on why their product was the greatest thing in the world. When they got on our show, the rules were different. First of all, they didn't have ten minutes; they had four minutes or whatever. Plus, they interact interact with me, and not my job was to protect the interests of the audience. To you know, to point out where their pitch wasn't accurate or wasn't truthful or where it had problems, and so we we talk about the show is not always live. Very often, the guy would come in and I'd say, you know, well, tell me a little bit about the product. He'd go on for ten straight minutes. I said, no, that's not how we do this. You know, I'm going to ask you a question. You're going to give me a short answer. I'm going to ask you a question. You're going to give me a short answer, uh, and I don't want your trade show pitch. I don't want your your investor pitch. You sound like the, the Socrates. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We have to have a discussion. Again, my job was to protect. Uh, frankly, I mean, I was the audience. So, I mean, I didn't have to try to work to protect the audience. I was the audience for the show. I wanted to learn this stuff just as much as the audience did. And I didn't want to be bullshitted with, you know, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, there were, there were challenges to get these people to talk our language, to talk the viewer's language, to talk the user's language, not to just sell because we weren't interested in selling. We wanted people to be aware of new, cool, cutting-edge technologies, and that was often not where, especially the marketing or the executive guys were coming from. And this was constant for 20 years. And you said some people got just downright hostile and abusive towards you. Uh, I would say, actually, sometimes the viewers did. Not so no, the viewers. Guests. Well, because I would, and I would often interrupt these guests and get them off their spiel and say, no, wait a minute, what about this? And people thought I was rude for interrupting these guests and not letting them go on and on. But again, I was looking out for the audience's perspective. I didn't really care whether the guests were happy or not. I wanted the viewers to be happy. And that sometimes meant, in normal parlance, being rude to these guys. I mean, there was once, I remember a long time ago, I, I made the mistake of, of doing a Google search on myself, and one of the first things came, that came up was the most hated man in America because people were bitching about the fact that they wouldn't let these guys go on and on and on. But that was my job. I mean, I wonder why the average person would want to want them to go on. It seems like they'd be more on your side. Yeah, they would, but I mean, I mean, you see that on television these days still. I mean, they don't understand that we have two different perspectives. The guest has one objective, and I have another objective. The guest, the guest's objective is to pitch his product and make his company and his product look good. My objective is to get good, balanced information to the viewer, and that's in conflict. So it's a constant conflict. And so sometimes we would disagree on how to do this, and I would have to just – it was my show. I had to take charge. And sometimes people thought I was not being polite enough to these, to these guests. Do you remember any uh, particular sacred cows – uh, in terms of guests, or yeah, or just in terms of people <clears throat> giving you lots of flack for uh, interrupting the pitch. Um, I don't remember any particular. I mean, you know, we had a lot of CEOs on the show, who, but they were big shots. You know, they were usually r running everything, and so it was a little difficult for them to be in a situation in which they weren't in charge. Uh, so I, <clears throat> I mean, this, I mean, you you name them. I mean, any any CEO we dealt with had had that issue. 
So yeah, Michael Dell in particular, I think you had singled out as. <laughs> uh, well, you, you watched that show, huh? Well, Dell was Dell. Like, I don't want to get too personal about that. He was just very rude to me. I mean, we 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 had tried to talk to him at it. We were at a trade show, and uh, you know, it's pretty good opportunity for a company or a CEO to get on our show. I mean, the show was seen by millions of people. It was around the world, so most people begged us to get on the show. Uh, we were in a situation where I was asking politely Michael to do an interview with us for the show, and he blew us off. And I've never bought a Dell product since. <laughs> Is that partly why you like HP so much now? Or? Uh, well, HP was a great friend of the show. There's no question about it. I mean, H H HP, I don't know about today, but HP was a great company. I mean, I did a lot of work with HP, and that was that was the best form of capitalism I'd ever seen. HP really worked hard to come up with a better product. It was a wonderful, wonderful company. I'm not sure it's quite the same these days, but certainly certainly back in the 80s and 90s, uh, I, I just loved to watch them the way they ran that company. They were, it was a great example of good company. As And there's some other, other companies like that too who really don't exist anymore. I mean, PeopleSoft was another example of a great principled company. <clears throat> But yeah, I, I'm I'm a big fan of HP. That is true. I want to talk some more about uh, Jack Tramiel. Yeah, uh, you know, just kind of wondering what he was like. Uh, you know, he did Commodore sixty four uh, yeah. days, and then after he went to Atari. Right. Uh, he knew nothing about technology. Couldn't really? care couldn't care, care less about technology. He was a businessman, and he wanted to sell the best product the lowest price, and he was very successful at that for a while. Uh, in fact, we had, you know, as, as I think I mentioned to you, Jack Tramiel had been on the show. We'd actually gone to Commodore and, and interviewed many of their guys and gone to their factory and so on. Uh, but Jack, uh, Jack would have been the same guy if he was selling shirts. You know, I mean, the fact that it was a computer and it had all these chips inside was irrelevant to him. He just saw this as a great opportunity to make money and to run a business. Uh, so it was interesting. I mean, he was different from most of the people we had on the show. I mean, even I mean, you take the Steve Jobs and the Bill Gates and these guys. I mean, they had some technology bent, even though they were very good businessmen. Shamil didn't know a vault from an ohm. I mean, he just, this was just a box. And he was going to figure out a way to make that box as cheap as he could and sell it to the most people he could, which, you know, you had to respect. I mean, he was a pretty clever guy. Uh, unfortunately, you know, the Amiga, I mean, it was one of those brilliant machines at the time. And I don't think, you know, he ever did a good job of really positioning the technology of what their products were. And unfortunately, when you got started out with the Commodore 64, you had a reputation as sort of low-end kind of thing. And I think, it, I think it was hard for people to appreciate that the same company that made the Commodore 64 could also make the Amiga 3000. And that it wasn't, wasn't the same deal. That it, while Commodore 64 was at the bottom of the heap, the Amiga at the time was really at the top of the heap in terms of what it could do. And I don't think Jack ever understood that really. I was wondering what your theories were on why the Amiga failed. Uh, lousy marketing. I mean, I was a huge fan, as, as as you know. I mean, it did things no other computer had done at the time. I mean, it was ahead. Of, it was ahead of everybody. But again, I think because Jack wasn't a visionary. I mean, he wasn't a Steve Jobs kind of guy. Uh, again, since he was treating it more like a commodity, not like an innovative, you know, iPhone kind of thing. Uh, there were, and there was never the understanding that you really had to promote and market the way, I mean, Apple was so good at, I mean, you know, Jobs was a master marketer before, above anything else. Uh, they just didn't sell it right. Um, but, I mean, it, same old story. We talked about, you know, beta versus VHS and CPM versus MS-DOS. You got to be a hustler. And he wasn't a hustler in the right way, I think, in pushing the Amiga. The Amiga was way ahead of its time. I still, to this day, I don't know if you remember the game Lemmings. Oh, sure. Which is on the Amiga. No one has ever matched that to this day in terms of, in terms of the brilliance of that game. Oh, I got lemmings in my head now. <laughs> yeah, well, me too. Uh, okay. Uh, so while we're talking about these sort of inexplicable uh, platforms that didn't take off, I also wanted to get your thoughts on the PS2. Well, the PS2, you know, was IBM PS2, yeah, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> and it wasn't really a failure. Uh, it was just another 
IBM machine. Uh, and I think, you know, there's a problem too with IBM. I mean, the personal computer, as we know now, with Lenovo taking over, I mean, it was not an important product to them. It was just something they felt they had to do. And uh, there was really nothing exciting about the IBM PC or the PS2. Uh, the, it was a very different strategy than Apple had, of course, because they, uh, IBM made it easy for clones, IBM clones to come out. So it was a very, very different uh, world for the IBM and the PS2. I mean, there's nothing wrong. PS2 was a good machine. It was a good, you know, MS DOS machine. Um, but I don't think there was ever a passion at IBM to support this. If you were at Apple, it was all about the Macintosh. I mean, that's what your business was. At IBM, the PC and the, and the PS2, this was just a small, small piece of their business. So it really, I think, never had the passion of management to really push it and promote it like it could. It was a good journeyman computer. I mean, you know, millions of people use them. So I don't think you'd call that a failure. Uh, but I don't think people understood the differences. In, and they made some other mistakes. I think it was a peanut they came out with, remember? I mean, they, they did some um, dumb things. PC yeah. Junior? Yeah, and the PC Junior. They did some dumb things trying to get to the low end. So uh, when you saw the PC Junior, did you just instantly think, that's a dumb idea? Yes. <laughs> you got it. You got it. Uh, yeah, once again, I mean, it's a, sort of the same problem that, that Commodore and Amiga had. Uh, they didn't, they did, I mean, the guys like Jobs and Gates understood the user. Guys like the head of IBM and, the, and, and Jack Tramiel at Commodore, they, did, they weren't users. This was just another product to them. So there was never that emotional attachment that, that really enabled them to push those products. But there was, you know, nothing, I mean, I used IBM PCs, many versions of them. I mean, it, it worked, you know, but it wasn't exciting. Yes, I was wondering if you ever used the new tech uh, video toasters on the show. We never used the toaster on the show, but we certainly showed the toaster several times. And, uh, yeah, no, we never actually worked, we never used the toaster. But, yeah, we, we had those guys from new tech on quite a few times. Um, and subsequent to that, I don't know if you remember, what was it called, the Trinity from Play? I don't, was, no, 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 don't know that one. Okay, that was the next generation toaster, basically. A lot of the people from New Tech left New Tech and started a company called Play. And Play built this TV studio in a box, which they called the Trinity, which was really, you know, up the, 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 the toaster in many, many ways. They went out of business, unfortunately, 10 years ago or so. Uh, but no, we never, and there are people who did use the toaster. I mean, there are people who produce stuff using the toaster, as you know. And I'll tell you a funny story, actually. When Play came out with the Trinity, which was the cheapest way to produce a television show. I mean, it, it was a box the size of a small office refrigerator, and it had everything in it. It was a TV studio. You put in, you took out, it produced everything. And the biggest user of the, of the Trinity at the time was a porno operation in L.A. <laughs> that produced porno things for the Internet. And I, it was really weird. I once went, went, went to visit them to see how they were using the, the, the uh, Trinity. And here's a studio of naked women and these guys shooting this show. And I'm here for the technology, not the groups, <laughs> you know. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, I know you got some uh, situations, I guess, with uh, Steve Jobs. You've mentioned it a yes. few times. Yeah. I know he didn't want to fund the show, but... Yeah, uh, I... It's unfortunate because of Steve. I was never an Apple fan. I mean, today I'm talking to you on a MacBook Pro right now, and I've got my iPad and my iPhone here. But, yeah, I mean, we went to Apple way back when we started the show. I mean, they were right down the, down the highway from us, and we thought they'd be a great sponsor for the show. And they were just starting out. This was pre-Mac. This was still Apple II days. And we made a big pitch to Apple to sponsor the show, and it went through all the different layers at, at Apple. And everybody thought it was a great idea. And they said, yes, yes, yes. So we're now going to make this final, I was going to make this final presentation to the Apple board, Steve is chairman, running the board meeting, about why these guys should sponsor this innovative new show called Computer Chronicles. And this was uh, shortly before 1984 in the famous Macintosh commercial 30 years ago. Uh, and Steve was just as rude and as obnoxious as a punky young kid could be. And said, why the hell should we sponsor your show? He said, are you going to put on only Apple products? I said, no, I mean, it's a computer show. We're going to put on your products and other Well, why the hell should I give you money if you're going to put on my competitor's products? 
I said, my guess is you advertise in a computer magazine that covers things other than just your product. I mean, you want to, anyhow, we had this very unpleasant conversation and it's kind of memorable at the time. He said, well, for the money I would give you, I can buy one spot on the Super Bowl. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> Yeah, so this all was taking place in front of this boardroom, I guess. Oh yeah, it was it was an awful yeah. meeting. Yeah, and again, he vetoed basically all you know the recommendation of his senior vice president, who had said this is a great idea. I mean, it was wasn't an expensive proposal at the time, but he was he was just really as annoying a person could be, and that was just one bad incident with Steve Jobs. So I guess he's one of the people that had those shark-like skills. You're saying you need to succeed. Yeah, he was, well, I guess people, I mean, un unfortunately, since his death, I mean, there's been sort of more objective reporting on the kind of guy Steve was, especially that book. He was a tough guy. He was a tough guy, a kind of really obnoxious kid, to tell you the truth. How would you compare him to Bill Gates? Quite differently, frankly. I, I, uh, most people don't like this, but I was a fan of Bill Gates. Bill was a really smart guy, obviously, and a decent guy also. Very fussy. I mean, had to be his way, but, you know, richest guy in the world or whatever at the time. I mean, he had a right to be a little little obnoxious, but he wasn't really. He was pretty and decent. What kind of guy. stuff did he get fussy about? Uh, doing it right. Doing it right. I mean, he had to do it right. He couldn't make mistakes. He couldn't be careless. Uh, and, you know, we did many of those computer bowl shows, which I co-hosted with him and interviewed him many times. Uh, it had. He was a good, tough intelligent manager uh and, and you, you couldn't bullshit him i mean he could see, he was very very smart guy i remember one of the great quotes i got from him i was interviewing him once and i was telling him asking him about the challenges of you know running a company like microsoft and he said i have one rule that everybody has to follow for every bit of good news you give me you have to give me bad news the problem was that managers only always told you the good things he said i can't do my job unless i know the problems I didn't care about the successes. That's easy. I want to know what's not working. Uh, and also, I remember another great quote from him. He said, you know, I said, what, what do you worry about? He says, every night I worry about what am I not thinking about that's going to do my company, which was very prescient in a way because there's a lot of things he wasn't thinking about at Microsoft. Uh, but he was a really smart guy. Uh, despite being a super-duper big shot, he was always a gentleman, uh, easy to talk to. Uh, I respected Bill quite a bit. And look what he's done now. I mean, you know, he's he's a different man now. Yeah, I wonder if he's getting a lot of news about Windows 8. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's another story. <laughs> okay, well, look, so what a, look, look what a problem they're having at Microsoft trying to replace Steve Ballmer, frankly. And I'm not sure Steve was the best choice to replace Bill Gates, but that's another story. Well, who do you think it should have been? Oh, but that's that, that's a tough one. Um, I mean, that's a complicated company, you know, with a lot of issues to deal with right now. I mean, it's ironic that you know their last quarter results are very good, thanks to Xbox primarily. Uh, so you know, it's hard hard to say. I mean, they they've they've failed at so many things they've tried over the past couple of years, and they're perceived now as sort of an old stodgy company, not a cutting edge company. That's partly because I think. Steve Ballmer was sort of the more the Jack Tramiel kind of manager. I mean, Gates was the visionary guy. He was the passionate guy. And, and having a really visible CEO like that, as with Steve Jobs, as with Larry Ellison, I mean, that's important, I think, in this business. And I think they lost that when, 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 uh, when Gates backed out. There's kind of a more general question for you. Yeah. I was uh, wondering what role you think uh, gaming and uh, all the focus on video games and computer games. How did that, what role did that play in spurring the technological growth? Uh, the biggest role of all. I mean, gaming pushed technology, you know that. I mean, the, the, you know, the, 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 all the stuff that happened on the computer was because people were pushing the, the envelope with games. I mean, if you were doing word processing and spreadsheets, you could do it on the dumbest computer in the world. But if you were doing 3D graphics, uh, if you were doing the, the, the kind of virtual reality stuff that games started to become, I mean, games drove technology more than anything else. I'd say I was always a big lover of games because that's, to me, that was where the cutting edge technology was. I mean, what, what else was going on that was interesting? I mean, you know, I basically said IBM PC business stuff was boring. So, yeah, better spreadsheet, big deal. 
But to, to take advantage of the graphics and the sound that you needed to make a game realistic, uh, I think computer games are the most, one of the wonderful, most wonderful things in the world. I mean, it really is, puts you in another world you could never otherwise be in, except for the technology of computers. I mean, you can get immersed, as you know, and meshed in a gaming environment, and the real world doesn't matter. I mean, you're just in this virtual universe. And to do that is a real technical challenge. Or even some of the things like, uh, you know, what, what's going on with, you know, things like Second Life or the other, you know, live virtual environments. I mean, that really pushes technology. Gaming had to be realistic to make it emotionally immersive. And so it really, had, you had to stretch that technology as much as you could. I mean, I remember way back, I guess this was, I know it was, I think this was an Atari game maybe, but, uh, you know, when you remember we had very limited storage, you had very limited memory capability. The guys who were squeezing this stuff into these games, there was a guy, I can't remember his, now, his name now, I think maybe Steve Kitchen. He did a, a, a space shuttle simulator in like, I forget, well, I mean, in a tiny, tiny, tiny program. And what he was able to squeeze out of that tiny amount of memory, that the, the tightness of that code was spectacular. So, I mean, gaming is it in terms of really pushing the technology. I mean, the two things that really push technology more than anything else were gaming and pornography. Because, <laughs> gaming and pornography. Well, I mean, because that required the most realistic rendition sure. of life. <laughs> That's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back uh, next week with part three of my interview with Mr. Stuart Chaffee. A lot of really great stuff coming up, guys. So if you like these uh, first two episodes, you'll definitely want to stick around. Uh, you can have my word on that. Uh, as always, I want to thank you very, very much if you have supported me in this show. Uh, remember, guys, if you want to join the team, just go to Patreon. I'll post a link there in the show notes for you. And you can uh, become a member of the Matt Chat Brigade. Um, a Matt Chatter, if you will. A lot of fun stuff um, uh, for signing up, including a, a special uh, members-only podcast. That hopefully the first episode of that will be ready uh, very soon now. Also, I have a big announcement. Uh, the book is out. The new book, Vintage Game Consoles, The Greatest Gaming Platforms of All Time. Uh, these publishers, they've just done an outstanding job with this. It's, it's uh, I mean, it's really wonderful stuff if you like uh, computer games or video games. Uh, despite the consoles and the title, we talk about computers like the Apple II and C64, as well as, of course, uh, the NES and Genesis and Dreamcast and so on. Uh, but anyway, what I think, uh, you know, what I really like about this book is we really get into the stories of the people uh, that made this stuff. So you get a lot of uh, behind-the-scenes information, a lot of really... Uh, awesome stories that I just don't think uh, you'll find in most, at least most other books. Uh, really worked hard to dig up uh, the research and find some stuff that hasn't been um, shared already in a hundred other places. So, uh, Vintage Game Consoles, I think you'll really like this if you like this show. Now, I, I, I'm going to send a copy of this, a signed copy, to my uh, sponsors and uh, executive producers. So, I need to make sure that if you're one of those categories, you need to get me your address. Uh, but if you want to, I got a few extra copies that publisher sent. So what I'm going to do is just to make things simple. Uh, if you want to sign copy, just send me $50 over PayPal. Let me know your address and I'll just sign it and send it to you. And I'll take care of the shipping and handling. Uh, if you don't want to spend 50 bucks, uh, you can always just have a copy sent to me uh, by Amazon. And then I'll uh, sign that and get it to you. I'm not really sure what the price is on Amazon right now. Uh, but basically, guys, if as long as you uh, pay for the book and the shipping and handling, I'm glad to sign it for you for free. Uh, and I think you really want a copy of this, so, uh, you know, enjoy. Also, if you do happen to get a copy of that and like it, uh, or I guess if you don't, uh, post a review on Amazon, if you will. It really makes a huge difference in getting uh, the word out about stuff like that. Anyway, guys, I appreciate it all. Okay, oh, man, let's wrap this up with a quotation. And uh, the quotation I found comes from Confucius. It goes something like this. The superior man knows what is right. The inferior man knows what will sell. See you guys next week. I've got no option but to sell you all for scientific experiments.